is director of the African Studies Program in the University Center for International Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. He also serves as co-coordinator of the Initiative for Effective Governance at the University. His major academic research for the last several years has been on the political transformation in South Africa and the development of political institutions in fragile states. <laughs> he has also carried out research on US foreign aid, security, and diplomacy. He is the author of ed an editor of 14 books and more than 40 articles and book chapters as well as numerous reports. He currently is principal investigator on a large is it use USAID, of course, funded program focusing on the assessment of programs addressed at conflict, conflict mitigation, and extreme violence in West Africa. Dr. Picard has worked as a teacher, a researcher, and a consultant in more than 50 countries, 44 of which are in Africa and the Middle East. We feel very honored to have him with us this morning. Please welcome Dr. Carr. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I'd like to make this as informal as I can. I have a few slides. I promise they're mostly pictures on the slides. That's the good news. The bad news is many of them are of me, so uh, you might get tired of that. So, but let me just start off by uh, talking a little bit about where I think I fit in in terms of my own work uh, internationally. Uh, there are a number of different ways in which one can work internationally. We tend to think of uh, international security and I just met a young man who's about to uh, enter into that in my part of the world probably with AFRICOM. Uh, international security obviously is both military but also intelligence and information. Diplomacy is the second uh, part of this process. It's the political relationships internationally. The third part we don't think so much about, although we're, we're hearing a little bit more about it now, and that is international trade. The world operates on the basis of business, and that means doing business internationally, and international trade, political economy areas are, are very important. The final area is the area where I have worked uh, since 1965, and that is international development. Uh, addressing issues, economic, social, uh, political, that relate to development both politically of countries, uh, socially of nations in terms of uh, economic development, individuals and organizations, uh, particularly but not exclusively in the, uh, in the private sector. So what I'd like to do this morning in the time that we have is just share with you some of my experiences. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about technical stuff. There'll be no equations or uh, no complex sentences probably. But I, I will uh, comment every now and then. And to make it informal, if anybody does have a question, please jump in. We'll be some time for comment questions afterwards. If anything pressing comes up or if I say anything either dumb or uh, unintelligible, just let me know. All right, let's get started. This is the list I would have made back in 1965. In 1965, in August, right out of university, University of Michigan, by the way, just for your information, I joined the Peace Corps. Peace Corps at that time was only about four years old. Uh, I wanted to go to Thailand. So they sent me to Uganda. <laughs> you know, what can you say? Some things never change, right? So, uh, but these were some of the issues that I was aware of and uh, certainly have observed over the years. Issues that still with, are with us today, issues relating to gender, gender violence, the issue of homelessness and street kids, the aftermath of war, of which we have still far too many, issues of refugees, uh, issues of extreme poverty, uh, issues of bad governance, let's be very honest, not all governance uh, works, and certainly not all governance in Africa works. And most importantly, the lack of education, the lack of health. Education for me, obviously I've been a teacher for many years, uh, is a very important part of this process and the problem. So let's start with the basics. This is a formula for disaster. These are uh, Images from uh, Uganda, uh, guerrilla movement called the Lord's Resistance Army, and of course on the other side, 
uh, extreme poverty. Uh, there's no way that this is going to end well as long as you've got those two pictures as part of the story. Let's now go back in history and talk a little bit about my first job, so to speak, right out of college. I taught for three years in the Peace Corps in a little town called Misaka in Uganda. Uh, and I'm the guy on the Oh, boy, was he young, huh? <laughs> Black hair and everything. I was uh, in a small town and uh, teaching English and history, and these were my colleagues at the time. Uh, they're a mixed group of people from Uganda, from uh, South Asia, from the UK, uh, and other parts around the world. And we did what teachers do. We had lesson plans, and we organized sports, and most of all, we taught reading, writing, history, and uh, arithmetic, and so forth. Uh, it was a tremendous experience. It, just, it got me hooked. I have not changed uh, my interest or my profession since. I started out as a teacher. I'm still a teacher. Uh, I still teach full-time at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, I don't play golf, so I don't have any plans for changing my profession anytime soon. It's also important to know a little bit about what you're doing, and one of the things that I uh, didn't know at the time, but that I began to understand after living in Uganda was, Uganda was a country which had divisions. All countries have divisions, of course. The division there was, in terms of political structure, uh, Uganda was made up of a number of kingdoms. You know, we don't think much about kingdoms anymore unless we're thinking about the American Revolution and getting rid of our kings. But those five areas in the south that are marked on the map were kingdoms. The problem was the areas in the north weren't. And in particular, one of them, what is called a Choli land there, was a much more egalitarian system. Uh, it was a system which was based upon the Luo language and culture Luo is a language of western Kenya and northern Uganda. Uh, its most famous father was a man named Barack Obama Sr. He was a Luo speaker and came from just on the other side of the Uganda border, right near the K in Kenya. So I came out there and six months later, uh, the kingdom that I was living in, Uganda, was overthrown. So that picture was taken right outside my front window. Uh, and I shouldn't have taken it. It was a dumb thing to do. Uh, you don't take pictures of invading armies when they're coming in. And, uh, but I was young, so I, I did. And uh, it's actually gives you a bit of a sense of what uh, it was like to be there. We were under occupation, and it's a 12 hour curfew, for about a year after that. So sensing what happens when the army comes in and takes over in a military coup uh, is, uh, uh, is an awesome kind of thing. So these were the characters that I was living with, not literally, although I met uh, the guy on the, uh, facing it on, uh, on our left there, Idi Amin. He was the head of the army. The man in the middle was named Obote, Milton Obote. He overthrew the third part of the equation, which was the king of the largest part of Uganda. And you probably uh, remember or at least have heard of Idi Amin and all of the antics and the tragedy that resulted there. Uh, that was an indelible part of the picture of, the, of uh, Africa that I was beginning to learn about in my three years there. Well, I decided, despite all of this, to stay working on Africa, working on Africa issues. And I did go back, eventually do a PhD at the University of Wisconsin, by the way. Uh, and as a, sorry, I just did not get back to Michigan. I always thought I would, but there I am, over there, uh, Bucky Badger. <laughs> we had a lousy football team back in those years anyway. So. But, fo but, but following that, and indeed for several years, I worked with a Danish international organization called Danita, uh, in uh, their foreign aid program. I was an instructor, and so I then moved back to East Africa. I lived in East Africa for about five years. Uh, again, I was doing some training and teaching for their experts going uh, overseas and working in about five or six <coughs> different Central African, uh, African countries. And so uh, this was my uh, local pub 
Uh, it also happened to be the party headquarters. To give you a sense of what it looks like to be in a political rally that was not yours, uh, this was the welcoming party for the president of Tanzania at the time in a little, little town called Tinguru uh, in northern uh, Tanzania. And here's his arrival. Uh, not a particularly bad leader in some ways. Uh, he was a collectivist, a socialist, uh, and that has caused problems ever since. But at least he was more or less democratically elected and had a sense of, uh, of peace and security that has uh, kept Tanzania out of trouble for most of its independence. Uh, from uh, Tanzania, I stayed overseas for, I lived overseas probably about 12 years. My next assignment was in Southern Africa, and uh, just to give you a sense, this was now 75. Uh, that was the uh, transit system that was in use in 1975. Uh, it actually doesn't work too badly, you know. It's not so good to be a mule in Africa or in Southern Africa, but uh, they were, uh, this was uh, uh, in the, uh, the edges of the Kalahari Desert, and of course, this was at the time a very poor country. Later on, uh, Botswana became, uh, discovered a lot of diamonds and became much more wealthy. And in fact, contrary to some images, uh, uh, a number of African countries such as Botswana have done very well. Uh, Botswana has, is one of the uh, better off countries now. Good use of resources, good management of their, uh, of their system of uh, mines, particularly the diamond sector. Uh, but again, uh, we're talking desert. Kalahari Desert is dry. The environmental challenges in my part of the world have been tremendous. This is an indigenous person. He is popularly sometimes called a Bushman, uh, more appropriately a member of the San or Basawa community. Uh, but uh, we're talking about a situation in which a very complex set of peoples live in most of these countries in different and sometimes uneasy relationships with one another. Uh, Botswana, which is a democracy, nonetheless has issues with different kinds of people, and the, the relationship be, between the Bushman or Basawa and the majority community has always been a, a difficult one. <coughs> so as I came back and started teaching, I did in fact uh, embark on what we might call a split career. Uh, I have taught at the University of Nebraska, uh, Big Red, uh, but I've also worked internationally for USAID, for State Department and uh, uh, World Bank, UNDP, primarily uh, in consulting basis uh, because I always maintain my, uh, my university uh, links. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, we're 78 now, so the hair is a little bit long. I got the beard. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, but it was the right color at the time. It was good uh, black beard, so I was okay. And we would meet every now and then in the State Department. This actually happened to be related to the uh, Uganda situation, which at the time, this was the last year that Idi Amin was in power. Um, we were talking about what might happen afterwards. Uganda was important. It, it was important regionally. Uh, it was already developing a reputation for being a, a harbor for refugees. And so it was, it was a concern, uh, aside from the fact that, of course, Amin himself had gained a lot of notoriety, mostly bad or comical, uh, and it was a, it was a, a real concern. Uh, I moved back to Botswana again for two years in the, in the early 80s, and of course, uh, that was the gas station that we had. Kalahari Desert is uh, about two-thirds the size of Texas. Botswana itself is the size of Texas, so uh, that's a lot of transport to, to worry about. The Kalahari uh, is rich underneath, but of course very poor on the, on the top. I was working at that time as a U.S. advisor in uh, Botswana. Uh, my concern has been for many years governance, democracy, uh, political institutions, and one of the concerns that I had had and that I had been asked to think about was, well, how do you formulate a local government system uh, if you're starting almost from scratch? Um, so uh, I spent about a year and a half working on a report. This is the report. Uh, local government structure in Botswana. Uh, I, along with a Swedish uh, colleague, developed it. It was completed in December 1981. 
approved by the National Assembly. And it's one of the documents I feel I maybe did something with because uh, Botswana has a reasonably good local government system, representative, it's uh, participatory, uh, elections are, are fair, and uh, uh, it has provided a grassroots stability which is uh, still far too rare uh, in many countries, not only in Africa but uh, around the world. By 1987 I had shifted started getting interested in, in South Africa. And Sally has mentioned I've, what started to be a two year project has lasted now almost, well, you can do the math. So I got started in interest uh, writing about South Africa and I've been writing about South Africa ever since. Uh, I managed to get good access to people in the early 1990s. This was a breakfast interview that I had with Men Nelson Mandela uh, in 1992. Uh, we had two of my students there and two of his advisors, the two women in back are both working for him. Uh, one of the things that we noticed, this was the first trip that Mandela did not travel with his wife. He was alone uh, and we learned later of course that Mandela's uh, uh, personal situation was about, to, uh, was about to change. So I was able to interview a number of people uh, at fairly senior levels. I've now done three books on South Africa. I think it's an important country. It's not as well known as it should be, particularly because of the social dynamics the societal relationships uh, and the uh, ability that South Africans have had to try to work together. Not in always easy situations and they're still struggling with it, but it's a, it's a powerful country, it's an interesting country. I strongly would encourage any of you who have interest in traveling uh, to make it one of your stops. Besides the, the game parks and the nature is, is tremendous. Uh, this was an interview in 1996 but that's uh, with the current president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, a technocrat and uh, uh, a manager who uh, we hope will bring South Africa back to where it, uh, where it should be. The, the concern in South Africa is good governance. That's the concern that one should have all over the world. If you do not have a modicum of good governance and consensus, uh, there's very little which can be achieved uh, uh, in the long run. This was a, the, the kind of work that I did for many years, working at the local government level. This happened to be a meeting in rural Ghana in 2005, uh, trying to understand and develop relationships between what we call in this country civil society organizations, nonprofits, community-based private groups and so forth, and the governance system at the, at the grassroots. Ghana, uh, no uh, thanks to me necessarily, but uh, Ghana is one of the more successful countries in Africa as well. While we talk about the failure, and we're going to come back to that in a moment, there are 54 countries in Africa. I've, I think I've been to about 44. That means I've missed 10. But that means you're talking about the complexity of a, of a continent uh, where things are so different uh, from one place to the other. You know, even though we're a single country in the U.S. with 50 states, uh, I think we recognize even within the context of our federal system, there are really differences as you move from one part of the, one part of the world, one part of the U.S. to another. I also have spent time working with nonprofits and humanitarian groups over the last few years. This is a group where I had a former student called Compassion, an NGO in uh, Nairobi, uh, Kenya, working with refugees in the northern part of Kenya, right near Somalia, which of course remains a problematic. Uh, and we tend to forget the kind of work that uh, nonprofits do. For, this is a uh, faith-based organization. Uh, there are both faith-based and non-faith-based organizations. Organizations uh, uh, matter. Nonprofits matter, and they uh, have a tremendous impact on uh, on people's lives. The last major policy challenge I worked upon was uh, actually not that long ago, 2009, and I was working on the what was then the government of Southern Sudan. In southern Sudan is a uh, uh, now an independent country called South Sudan. If you read the international news at all, you realize that uh, South Sudan has had real problems uh, since 2011. There are more than two million refugees. 
uh, extreme civil war has broken out there. Uh, there are about a million of them in northern Uganda alone. Uh, and what were we asked to do? Uh, I am almost embarrassed to say. We were asked to assess the capacity of the government of southern Sudan to have independence. Uh, uh, we probably got it more right than we really wanted to, but the uh, international community, including the U.S., was convinced for various reasons that Sudan had to be broken up, and we did, it probably was a mistake. Uh, you, breaking something up does not necessarily make it better. It may make it worse, or at the worst, it may make it more complicated. But these kinds of decisions, which are made on the basis of uh, reports like this, and I was the lead author on it, uh, have an effect. And I'm not going to take the blame for it. I think the uh, leadership in South Sudan has been anything but uh, stellar. Uh, but these kinds, of, uh, these kinds of activities do have an impact, positive or in this case. Well, I don't think we had a negative impact, but I'm, I'm not sure we shouldn't have been a little bit more forceful in what we said. This was a European Union, US, uh, UK joint activity, so it had a fairly high level of visibility. Uh, it, uh, it was uh, the beginning of a sad story. The latest project, which we're still working on, we're just rounding up, was in West Africa, focused on peacekeeping training. Uh, we were working at Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Training Center in Accra, Ghana. Kofi Annan was uh, uh, an earlier Secretary General of the United Nations. And what we were trying to do, and have been trying to do for the last five years, is assess the impact of various peace-style activities on a population. So a lot of it was survey research. We were uh, uh, contracting out and uh, uh, doing surveys in three countries, Niger, Burkina Faso, and uh, Chad, three countries right above Nigeria, the primary focus there is both Boko Haram, who you may have read about. That's the group, the sweet group that kidnaps uh, uh, children, especially girls, 14 uh, years and up. The biggest catch was about 300 of them several years ago. It also is a center, that is a center for uh, uh, Al-Qaeda in uh, Maghreb, one of the ISIS-affiliated groups which uh, remains very active in those three countries and in, in Mali. Uh, measuring impact is interesting. Uh, the techniques that are used are varied. Sometimes it's radio broadcast, sometimes it's local community-based activities, sometimes it's drama uh, or film or other uh, ways of influencing public opinion. But as we know, public opinion doesn't change easily. Uh, and that's really at the, at the crux of some of the dilemmas that we face as we think about democracy and governance, uh, not only in Africa, but in other, parts of the, in other parts of the world. That was the closing ceremony, I think, uh, of our training course back in uh, 20, 2014. Uh, that, well, that was the training. That was the certificates being given out. Uh, uh, that was two years later, 20. That was last year, actually, November. So, what are the social issues in 2018? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, yes and no. It was. They're still all there. Some of them are not so bad. Some of them are worse. Uh, life is complex. Life and uh, Africa is complex, and yes, all of those things are still a challenge after uh, something like 54, 54 years. Uh, but I guess that doesn't mean you stop. Uh, uh, other parts of the world, whether they be Europe or Asia or Latin America, face similar kinds of issues historically. Some of them going back a lot longer than the conflicts in various parts of, of Africa. So what do I think is the problem? Well, I go back to the uh, issue that we started with, which is the, uh, the issue of governance. Uh, this is a group uh, led by Joseph Kony and friends. This is in Uganda. Uh, it's probably about five, six years ago. It's called the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, I'm not sure of its relationship to the Lord or what it was resisting. Uh, but this is a conflict that has engulfed uh, really 
northern Uganda from 1986 at least, really before, but in active form to the present. Uh, these, this bunch, this motley crew, is still around. Uh, they were driven out of Uganda, but they're still floating around in the what's called the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the Central African Republic. They're still there. They can't get, they can't find them. They flip in and out of South Sudan uh, and they still wreak havoc on people. Uh, what are some of the things that they like to do? Well, they kidnap children. That's one of the things they like to do. Uh, the 14-year-old the, the boys they put in the army. Uh, the 14-year-old girls, they make sister brides for the military. Leave it at that, I think. Uh, you can figure that out. Uh, they also tend to, uh, when they kidnap the kids, they make the kids kill their parents. It's the second set of activities that they, they do. Thirdly, where there is resistance, they tend to like to mutilate people. So they cut off their ears or their lips or their nose. They don't kill them. They just leave them. Now, is there anything unique about those people? I don't think so. I think we know of atrocities that have existed in other parts of the world, including uh, much of the history of uh, Europe, especially during uh, before and during World War II. The, the, the thing that is so important to understand is that this group operates in a, an environment of anarchy. They can do what they want to do because there is no way to stop them from doing. Now, this is perhaps not the place to talk about sort of you know, the foils of humanness, uh, but we all know that uh, uh, we are all imperfect and that one of the things that regulates us is governance, our governance systems, and a consensus as to what the rule of law should be. So, uh, the, to me, the key to the problems that we looked at, if I can go back here, here is this and dealing with this from the context of a governance system. We get a governance system in place that is acceptable to most people of different language, different culture, different race, different uh, ethnicity, uh, and you have the beginnings of something you can work with. Without it, it's extremely, <coughs> extremely difficult. Professor. Yes, please. May I ask a question? Sure, go right ahead. What is, what is Coney's motivation? Is it, is, it mo is it money or is he just a statistic? Uh, wow, that is the $64 question. For him as an individual, um, there are probably uh, a historical, perhaps even psychological reasons for him doing what he does. But he doesn't operate in a vacuum. He, of course, has his followers. And he operates within a society, this is a trolley land, as we talked about it at the beginning, uh, which has felt a historical sense of victimization within the context of the history of Uganda for the last hundred or so years. So the behavior is in large part related to things that probably Kony as an individual doesn't entirely understand. One of the things that I found interesting as we were working on a project, uh, our Hidden Peoples project over the last couple of years, there are well-educated Acholi in London and in this country who have historically lawyers, business people, other professionals who support legally, economically, Coney and his group. Not because they particularly like Coney, but because he is they think addressing a victimization issue, an issue of historical uh, wrong, which is, needs to be righted. And if you, if you get at the motivations of a lot of these individual leaders, you, you get into this complexity of victimization. We are victims, we, are, we have been wronged, and we, we, we therefore have to do whatever we can in order to reverse that process. So uh, I don't, I'm not a believer in the individual motive so much, except as it being reflective of a social, political, or even sometimes a religious environment. If we go back to our Al-Qaeda uh, sort of ISIS uh, 
uh, examples for a moment. It's like the Hutu and Tutsi in, in Rwanda. Yeah, exactly. And you know, you say that's that's racial or ethnic or religious. Well, uh, in a sense, except that they speak the same language, they have the same culture. They look a little different, but not all that much. So these are so complex. Uh, we're complex. We tend to forget how complex we are as human beings. Jump in. Yeah. Well, it, you, you haven't used the word tribe. Um, yeah. And and when I was in Kenya in the 80s, living there, yeah. people really identified with tribe. Yes. And in fact, they kept asking me, what tribe are you yeah. from? Right. And um, yeah. are, are people still identifying with tribe? <coughs> and they, are they calling it that? Or? What, what are the dynamics yeah. now? The, the, the latter is important. People still use the word tribe and they call each other tribe. Mm -hmm. It has somewhat of a pejorative nature, but what tribe is is an ethnic identity. Right. It's like you know being in Italy and identifying as an Italian or being in Serbia and identifying as a Croatian. Mm -hmm. Same language, same culture, different religion. So yes, ethnic issues, whatever you want to call them, Ethnic issues remain important. In Uganda, the Acholi identification in the Luo language is part of an identification that relates to that sort of myth. I will call it somewhat mythology of wrongness, of being wrong, that uh, leads to a Rwanda, leads to the Lord's Resistance Army, leads to what's going on in South, uh, South Sudan today. So, yeah, you, you, you've really identified an, an important set of issues. The issue of language, culture, we know that's important. We, we understand cultural, religious values and differences. Uh, we're not without them in this country or anywhere else in the world for that matter. And they can be differences like herding and farming. In the well, well, in the case of, the, that's right, yeah. And, and, and indeed, the, the economies in northern Uganda are more based on cattle keeping. keeping. Uh, southern Uganda is much more agricultural and light industry. And of course, economic differences are important. If you're in a trolley, you're going to be really, really, really poor. You have a good, better chance of being middle class if you're in southern Uganda living in Kampala. Mm -hmm. Not without its poverty, of, of course. Just, just to wrap up, I have a few more slides. Uh, to talk about some of the uh, work that we've been doing outside the University of Pittsburgh. I still am a uh, full-time employee of the University of Pittsburgh. They haven't figured out how to kick me out yet. So. <laughs> and I'm hanging in there until they do. <laughs> so, um, but I am also, and uh, my wife Pauline, who's here, is, uh, uh, we've created a, an organization called the uh, ASA Social Fund for Hidden Peoples. I'm the president. Just like Giddy, I mean, I just decided. <laughs> not, not quite. I have, I, you know, it was a one party slate, but I was elected, so. Uh, we've been working on uh, problems, particularly in Uganda, because that was where I started, if you may remember, many years ago. Uh, we have a, uh, a number of activities that uh, are sort of caught in our vision of what we're trying to do. Um, what we're, we're looking at, looking at within the context of the issue of governance, three things. We believe in something called social entrepreneurialism. So uh, entrepreneurialism, I, many of you know, I know many of you probably at one time were involved in business or the private sector. It means in, you know, being entrepreneurial and, and, and making money. We do see the role of philanthropy in the process, but we're, we're, we're very concerned about income generation income growth, the growth of capital, the growth of capital though not only for personal but also for social reasons. So the argument is if you're going to promote economic development you've got to figure out also a way to function within the private sector, the world economy and our local part of it in this uh, in this country uh, through some kind of creativity. So we support social entrepreneurialism uh, particularly in terms of small business development, microloans, and so forth, uh, where our overall concern is that also social needs be met, particularly again in health and education. Uh, if you don't have an education, uh, uh, you're, you and your family are not going to go very far. And of course, if you don't have access to health, you're not going to be around very long anyway. So these are two fundamentals. And then the third is our governance, which is the concern about reclaiming for all, especially those that are discriminated against, are hidden, 
basic human rights and human security. So uh, that's sort of what we do now uh, outside of the research that I continue to do and the, the teaching. So I wanted to just close just by saying a few more things about that. Uh, we've been working particularly with a group called uh, Bright Kids Uganda. They run a, uh, Victoria Nalongo Namasisi runs a home in uh, Uganda that uh, essentially takes kids off the streets out of impoverished families, gives them a uh, a home for their uh, childhood uh, and takes them through, this is important, we try to take them through university, college, or some other form of tertiary education. Grade school is not enough. Reading and writing is not enough. Again, you have to have enough resources, uh, skills, and uh, uh, knowledge in order to make your way in the world. So uh, we, uh, we've been doing this for eight years now. Uh, we operate through the University of Pittsburgh. I take interns, graduate students, masters, PhD students out every year and we support uh, activities that are related to this and a number of other, uh, a number of other organizations. Uh, we work with a group, uh, a gender violence group called Sarasav, uh, which is a group of uh, women uh, who have gone, uh, suffered, and then survived uh, acid attacks. I don't know if you understand what happens when, you're, when uh, a battery acid is thrown in a person's face. You can get a little sense. We didn't want to have uh, two graphic pictures, but uh, you get the idea. This, unfortunately, in other forms of gender violence, is an important part of the lack of education, and uh, lack of uh, good governance systems. I think the two go together. Uh, this is Cockway. This is where we work a lot of the time. Uh, there was a film, Walt Disney film, a year or so ago about a young woman who learned to play chess in Cockway, Queen of Cockway. It was a decent film. Uh, it, was a it was a Walt Disney film, so things looked a little better uh, than in real life. But uh, this, is the, this is the challenge of homelessness. This is the challenge of disability. This is the challenge of... Uh, of violence, uh, it is in living conditions uh, exactly like this uh, all over the world, but certainly in many parts of uh, in many parts of Africa. We also work with education programs. This is a primary school uh, led by a man by the name of Medi Bugembe. Medi was uh, five years a uh, street child. He was homeless. Was pulled out of the streets by Bright Kids Uganda. He's now uh, around 30 years old. He's the headmaster or the uh, lead teacher and the lead teacher at uh, Great Kings and Queens. Many of the kids that he teaches and takes through the education system are now um, uh, off the streets of Cotway. We, we've developed a system which sort of integrates different sets of activities uh, into, a, uh, into a, a network, I think it's good to say. One of the other problems that we tend not to think about in uh, in uh, uh, poor countries and particularly uh, in parts of uh, uh, Africa and Asia and Latin America is the issue of special needs. People who have been born or who have developed special needs uh, over time. This of course, this special needs school called Noah's Ark uh, works with extremely uh, challenged, we can put it that way, kids, uh, both physically and, and mentally. Uh, and that's a hard one. One doesn't know exactly how to address it. We're working with the, this program. It's only four years old, but it's developed uh, very rapidly in the four years. And then we're working in a project in the north, uh, in a town called Barlonio. And this is uh, the this is what happens when a village is burned down. The, the picture on the left is a is a village uh, burned down by the LRA by Joseph Konya. Uh, between three and five hundred people were burned alive. Uh, we don't know the number, but of course there are many survivors and we're working with the survivors. They're still not recovering. You don't recover when your city has been burned uh, very rapidly. So uh, we're particularly pleased with a microcredit project that we're working with there. And of course uh, our Adaptive Village, uh, Adaptive Village program tries to provide some uh, basic support 
uh, in terms of reconstruction, but most importantly in terms of market development, education, uh, and support for health. Uh, the last two shots are the uh, a little more optimistic. Uh, these are some of the students that uh, uh, we bring over. Uh, this is 2016. Uh, we have been bringing over between five and ten students a year to work on actual projects, writing proposals, uh, trying to find money for grants. Uh, and of course, we're I guess we're having a good time just chatting. Uh, and. Uh, this is the group we worked. Uh, we took out. Just uh, they're still mostly out there uh, in May of this in May of this year, uh, and uh, it's a good experience. They're all these are all uh, uh, for the most part master's degree students. They're professionals, and so they have lots of skills that they can take uh, out into the uh, uh, out into the field, and uh, uh, they they offer a lot, and they get a lot more than what they what they actually offer. I, is what's my prognosis for success with the new government in South Africa. I remain very optimistic about South Africa. Though South Africa faces challenge, challenges are related both to poverty but also to wealth. There is a tremendous amount of both human and economic resources there with all of the economic and social differences that that, that creates. That said, Despite apartheid and despite all of the history of South Africa in terms of race relationships, I believe they're going to make it. Now, is it going to look exactly like one would hope it would look? Probably not. But I think the, uh, the, the, the economic resources are there. They have not fled. Some money has moved out, but not most of it. Uh, and there is a there is enough of a commitment in all of the sectors, I believe, to try to make it work that I remain cautiously optimistic. The big problem in South Africa, if you read anything about it, is, of course, the corruption, the, the state-related, what I call cronyism, uh, getting access to resources not on the basis of law or on the basis of merit, but on the basis of who you know. And Of course, we don't, we don't ever... Mm -hmm. We have to worry about that. Yeah. Our part is mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder what the impact is of the increasing Chinese presence in Africa having. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there are, there's, the, there's good and bad. Uh, that's a wishy-washy answer. I, I think the infrastructure that's going in there has done a lot. Uh, they're building a nice new ring road around Kampala, which means traffic is moving much more easily. When I'm in... Uh, on that road, I don't think uh, it is probably the, the road's better than most Michigan roads. I mean, I'm not saying that. It's brand new. <laughs> so, but uh, there, there are political costs and there are uh, distortions related to it. Um, but I think you have to see the Chinese influence within the context of there's also a strong, especially in East Africa, Indian influence. Indian investment is going in. Uh, there continues to be a strong European presence, particularly from countries that have historically been related to it. Uh, uh, China has had some backlashes. Uh, there's a country in Central Africa called Zambia, which has not had happy relationships with, uh, with China over the years. So they're coping. Uh, we, we don't know, any of us, uh, the impact of 21st century China. It is a huge, complex influence on the world. So uh, it, I'm not going to say it's not there and it's not really very important, but I, don't, I just don't think we know we're able to measure the entirety of it. And the inf they're addressing infrastructure questions which nobody else is doing. So There are also lots of Chinese settlers all over Africa building up little bi businesses, contributing, but also perhaps displacing as well at the same time. So, yes, please, and they're over there. Yeah. When you're working with local governments to try to develop the civic uh, structures and whatnot, what's the role that the tribes play? Apart from individual identity, mm -hmm. do they have political power? How does that work out with the tribes? All right. So, a lot of it relates to traditional custom and law. Law is important, and traditional law is an important influence. Very hard to avoid the way people have historically governed and especially made laws 
for themselves. And most importantly, a lot of that relates to land and land ownership. Uh, land ownership is not clean under traditional law. It's complex, it's easily manipulative, manipulated uh, over time. Uh, so you, reconciling traditional law, traditional political culture, and, and I'm not going to say modern, but uh, let's call it uh, common law if it's British or uh, Roman, Roman Dutch law if it's continental, uh, is very difficult. It's in those areas that it's important, but it's also important in terms of social behavior and perception of what we could call otherness. I'm me, I speak this language, I have this value system, you don't and what comes out of that. So the, a lot of the, we talked about this before, a lot of the ethnic violence is also related to traditional values and the clashes that occur in, from one part of a place to another part of it. You know, uh, Lansing versus Ann Arbor. It's almost that bad. Or even worse, Columbus versus Ann Arbor. Yeah, so go ahead, yeah. In terms of economic development, we yeah. spent a little time in the southern part of uh, Uganda, mm -hmm. and uh, I can't understand how the money flows. I don't understand how the tax system works, okay. how there would be money to make a, a, a better system for right. water so people wouldn't be carrying jugs on their heads. Right. Um, yeah. Where does the money come from and where does it go? Okay, well, the, the money usually comes from people who earn it or who make things or sell things, but uh, the, the the tax system is, is, is a real issue in many countries, certainly in Uganda. The tax system, we think our tax system is probably not the best. None, none of us like April 15th very much, but compared to what uh, you have in many countries, it, it works. Uh, Uganda, the tax system doesn't work. Much of the mo money seeps out in various ways through the technical term is called rent. They borrow it, in a sense, or they borrow the influence that relates to it. But you know that money never gets back to where it's supposed to have been. So corruption, cronyism, patronage, uh, uh, nepotism, all of these things are how the money sifts, uh, moves through the system. So there isn't a chance to either uh, use the money for a common cause, a purpose, such as water, nor is it uh, possible to use it uh, to promote merit access for credit. So for example, in Uganda, one of the reasons why we have chosen microcredit is that the commercial bank rate of interest is around 33%. How would you like that to try to buy a house? So nothing occurs on credit. And so that's, uh, and, and, if, and that's, that's the evidence of the, the flow. It doesn't go in a system that we understand, at least in terms of uh, uh, banking and uh, banking systems uh, in our part of the world. So, and yes, a lot of it's hidden. It is hidden from view because it moves in and out of the country. It moves in and out of individuals' pockets. Much of the money never flows through institutional arrangements, if I can use that term. Yeah, go ahead, and then I'll catch you. As you know, we've got a fairly large military presence yes. in Africa. Yeah. From your uh, perspective, how effective is our presence there in terms of stability or mm -hmm. national interest? It's, boy, it's hard to give a simple answer to that question. Uh, I, I, be I believe uh, AFRICOM, which is the geographical uh, operation that uh, manages it, I believe technically it, it, uh, it's terrific. It does good stuff when it understands what it's doing. We're not always sure the message that is given down uh, is related to the situation on all times. The Niger system is a good example. I still don't quite, haven't quite figured it out. It didn't work right. Uh, on the other hand, I do believe that you, you need the ability to deliver security using military force if necessary, but the message has to be clear and it has to be agreed upon and now you realize that's, you know, that's the, that it's, you know, it's hard for one country to come to agreement on what it's doing 
And then in West Africa, for example, we're working with the British and the French, both close allies, but you know, not close enough so that we always agree on what's going to be done. So we've, we've, been, uh, we've been working well with the French, which is interesting if you're my age, you remember de Gaulle and all of the, the bad years. Uh, it's, uh, it's worked fairly well. But, you know, it's, it's the repair tire. It's, it's the tire you put on the car to get back to town. It's not going to take you to Los Angeles or New York City. It's the, fir it's the first tech tool that you have. And it's the second and third tools that you often need uh, to get the thing more permanent. Again, I would argue then you go beyond the, uh, the military to first the peacekeeping, and then secondly, the fundamentals, the education, uh, the social system, the health, and <coughs> decent governance, starting at local level and building it, building it up. And you, you had a comment. Oh, uh, and I see, think of you being over there so many years. Yeah, and uh, you're still alive. And have a problem. <laughs> Some people and, uh, debate that, but yeah, I don't. Don't you ever yeah. face the problem of the water, which I know is in the <clears throat> lakes, yeah, and everything else? Getting decent water that people can survive. Getting decent water is the number one health issue, yes. But of course, when I go there, I have uh, uh, resources, and what I do is I immediately find a case of these, because I can afford to do it. So if you have a case of these and you have a place to replenish them, you're not going to drink the tainted water. But it's the, it's the people who are, don't have access to clean water who are drinking out of a a pond or uh, even a dish uh, that are going to uh, essentially come down with all kinds of waterborne uh, diseases. So again, your water is a resource and it's a resource which is not, it's not free. Yeah, dirty water is pretty free as long as it's raining, but clean water is costly. And that's, again, at the heart of the, at the heart of the issue. And, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I remember um, the hopes we had in as uh, uh, Rhodesia became Zimbabwe, right. Bishop Abel Mozareva, yes. the United Methodist Bishop, sure. uh, yep. Yep. Um, in 1978, yeah. uh, uh, just the sadness of yep. all the years that he wasn't elected, that Robert Mugabe was, and everything. Well, he was elected that. once, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> one president, one vote, one time. <laughs> but yeah. what are your reflections on Zimbabwe? Yeah. Uh, grateful for the United Methodist University at Mujer. Uh, well, I have I've actually worked, uh, we've, I've been working at Africa University. I have a colleague, a good friend who was the uh, Vice Chancellor, Rukudzo Marapa, for about five, six years. Uh, uh, I think Africa University, unfortunately, had we had it ten years ago, uh, earlier, uh, could have made a difference. Uh, the, I, I remain optimistic about Zimbabwe, particularly, uh, you know, uh, Mugabe actually survived and he became an ex-president. Took us a long time to do it, but uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. If they can get through elections, and it doesn't matter really who wins as long as it's perceived to be fair. Uh, there is a lot of resources still there. There's a lot of resources in South Africa that would come back and there are a lot of skilled people in Europe primarily, but also in this country, who would be willing to go back. Um, the, uh, the United Methodist Church has played a major role in Zimbabwe. Uh, they continue to do so. I have a, we have some friends in, uh, in Pittsburgh who operate a big medical complex, United Methodist Church parishes, in uh, north of Mutari in, uh, in, the north, uh, in the northeast. But again, uh, you know, if we get another Mugabe, and we're not out of the woods yet because the same ruling party still is in power, uh, it could go it could go bad again, right? I, I, we're we're working with a group at Africa University on a project, and they remain optimistic. We're working with the peace. There's a peace center there that was set up by, uh, in part with uh, with my involvement. Uh, that um, is, uh, they've got their fingers crossed. There's a strong civil society there which we don't know much about. It's gotten dormant over the years because being in you know, an advocacy group in Zimbabwe wasn't exactly healthy for you uh, always, but uh, they're coming back to life, I think. So. Yeah, please. Not really a question. Though. Peace Corps connections, we still uh, get together, and uh, many of my students, because I'm in an 
program that sponsors a uh, master's degree in international development, our former Peace Corps types. So mm -hmm. I'll definitely look, look that up. Yeah, go ahead. You, you mentioned uh, microfinancing. Yeah. Uh, have you any impression of what Kiva does? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is, yeah. Does it work? Well, I think it does. And the problem, of course, is the uh, there are many microfinancing pro programs, and that's, I think, one of the better ones. I've not directly been involved with it, but uh, the only problem with the microfinancing we've found, and I think this is not unique, it's the problem of paying back. <laughs> you know, you've got to pay back. And getting that mechanism in place for people who are not used to paying back is, is, the, pro is the challenge. Where it works and people are paying back, we're using now the, so they call it the Grameen Bank model, which is the group model where you uh, put uh, five, six people in a group, and if one doesn't pay back, it shuts down for the whole group. Uh, that that's, seems to work. But it's, a, it's a hard. I mean, uh, paying back loans is an issue. And so, uh, but yeah, I, I, again, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't think microfinancing is the whole answer. Microfinancing is micro, and so you're dealing even in Africa with a macro, and the micros are never going to add up to that macro. So it's going to be in combination with other things. And I do think the, uh, however, the microfinancing system is partly an educational process. It's learning business. It's learning accounting. It's learning uh, marketing. It's learning profit versus loss at a very, uh, and these are people who are not children. These are mid, uh, middle-aged adults in most cases or younger, to, uh, perhaps younger women in many cases. Uh, so it's, it's, it's that. It's the, it's the uh, circulation of money. It's getting some money into the community. Uh, so, uh, again, it's, it's within the context of other things and within the context of getting the, the money right, getting the corruption issue addressed. You can never, you'll never create a perfect corrupt-free system, as we know, but you, it's better. There are places that work better than others in Africa, and we have Transparency International. We have a rough idea of how the world works. Uh, you know, we know the Scandinavian countries are probably the least corrupt anywhere in the world, and that has helped. So, go ahead, you want to... How are you involved with microfinance? Well, we, we uh, work with uh, uh, organizations here. Uh, we're working with Rotary in western uh, Ohio, or uh, eastern Ohio right now, to set up a, a microfinance system through Rotary Kampala. So our, our role, using again some of our students and former students, is te the technical side, getting it set up, getting the systems in place. I've got a group of my students right now doing an assessment of uh, an existing program we've been supporting. So ours is the uh, learning and uh, replicating side of it. So hopefully Rotary provides the, the resources. Dr. Picard, you yeah, are willing to stay a little sure. bit?